All right, hello. Uh, my name is Jean Vash Carneiro. I'm a graduate research assistant at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, and I'm also a Lakasha Fellow. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank my co authors, Dr. Cody Allard, he's a GNC engineer at LAST, and my advisor, Dr. Hans Peter Schaub. So I'm going to be talking about modular rotational stability analysis of spacecraft with rotating flexible solar arrays. So previous work introduced a novel way of deriving the equations of motion of spacecraft that are composed of a rigid hub with an n degree of freedom effector attached to it. Uh, this effector consists of um, n links um, and the novelty with this approach was that uh, no assumptions on mass distributions, namely mass and inertia, were, were taken before the derivation of the equations of motion. Um, the spin axis can be general, uh, and so can the uh, orientation of the frame of each link. And so what we get from this formulation uh, is just a general uh, set of equations of motion that are uh, applicable to any distribution and and any distribution of links um, and uh, that's that's really powerful and so what we wanted to do was to expand on that work um, under the idea that each link instead of rotating freely uh, could approximate the flexing of a flexible body right so when we have a number of links chained together we can actually simulate uh, flexible spacecraft that way, where each link uh, can rotate, about, can flex basically about that spin axis if we introduce a spring and mass coefficient to each spin axis. Uh, so that was the idea was to take that generality and 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 uh, the the idea of removing the assumption was sort of expanding that work into uh, flexible uh, dynamics. And so we'll start off with a problem statement here. This is pretty generic, but it, as you'll see, this will fit the numerical simulation that I'll show, the numerical results that I'll show. And so basically we have here is a spacecraft with a hub in gray. Uh, the hub has a, a B frame and attached to it, we have two solar panels. Uh, now each solar panel can rigidly rotate about a spin axis F hat um, through an angle alpha and actually rotate symmetrically. Now each solar panel can also flex uh, about that rigid rotation. And we can flex about uh, any, anywhere from one mode to three modes. So we can bend, it can twist, or we can um, do a pinwheel mode. Um, and so that's that's a general problem setup. It can rigidly rotate, and it can also flex about that rigid rotation. But first, we need to introduce the nonlinear equations of motion. Um, so this really was driven from previous work. Uh, and so here we have the kinematic equations of motion. Here we're just showing that uh, we picked the uh, modified Rodriguez parameters as the uh, uh, attitude set of choice. Um, and so that's the first equation that's the kinematic differential equation for the MRPs. Um, and then the second equation just shows uh, that the time rate, how, how the time rate of change of each flexing mode relates to the, to the flexing mode itself. We also have the hub rotational equation of motion. Um, again, there's not a lot to say here. Uh, we've kept things very general and we didn't do make any simplifications. So all the cross coupling terms are, are here still. Uh, and finally, we have a rotational equation of motion for each spinner. So for each mode, um, we also have a, an equation of motion. Um, so to uh, sort of expand on this work, we need to enter to be, uh, for this work to be applied into flexible dynamics, we need to linearize the equations of motion. So for the kinematics equations of motion, they're pretty trivial. Uh, so the MRP equations of motion just simplify to the derivative of the MRPs being one over four times the angle of velocity. Um, and then the uh, time rate of change of the mode doesn't actually change, it was linear all along. Um, for the hub rotational equation motion, we're doing two things here. First of all, we're decoupling the translation motion from the rotational motion. And so all translational components um, are excluded. And second of all, all implicit second order terms are also removed. And what I mean by that is implicit second order terms are terms that are, uh, basically consist of two first order terms that are being multiplied together. Um, and those through the linearization just vanish. We can actually do the exact same thing with, with each mode, with each uh, mode's equation of motion. 
And what we get is a set of simplified equations uh, that I'll show here. So this is actually the main contribution of this paper. Um, what you see here is the linearized hub rotational equation of motion. And what we see here is that we've kept the mass distributions general. We've kept the location of the panels general. Um, and uh, the most interesting thing here is that we have this double summation. So the inner summation is for every mode. So from one to three, we can we can sum, we can choose that each panel has uh, one mode, two modes, or three modes, or we can even have different panels have different modes if that's what we want. And then the outer summation, it basically sums over all panels. So if you want to have five panels instead of two, that's also possible. And the equations here are general that way. And we also have a similar result for the uh, each for each mode's rotational equation of motion. Um, we see the summation over the modes as well. And again, the mass distribution is um, completely arbitrary, and so is the location of the panels. Okay, so from these linearized equations of motion, we need to put them into state space and discretize them. So to put them into state space, uh, we write them in this form. Uh, so it's this is m x dot is equal to AX plus BU, where M is the mass matrix, A is the system's uh, state matrix, and then B is the control matrix. Uh, you might have seen this written as X dot is equal to AX plus BU. They are completely equivalent. Uh, you just need to invert the mass matrix on both sides. Um, and the state vector is shown here on the right. Um, so we have the attitude of the hub in MRPs, the angle of velocity of the hub, um, and we also have the mode and the time rate of change of that mode um, for all modes of each panel. And we need to discretize the system. So this is continuous time, what I've shown. We need to actually discretize the system because our control input is discrete. Um, and so uh, to go from continuous time to discrete time, we are assuming a zero order hold um, through a control sample time um, of TS. And so the equation now becomes x at k plus 1 is equal to f of x of k plus g u of k. After this, we apply the Laplace transform. So the z domain Laplace transform is shown here. Uh, basically, x of k becomes x of z, u of k becomes u of z, but x of k plus 1 actually becomes z times x of z. Um, further, if we assume that the control input is it consists of a gain matrix times a reference state. This is a very common assumption. We can, we can actually find the uh, equations for the open loop and the closed loop system. Um, so the open loop system is shown here, and H is the uh, open loop transfer function. Um, and on this side, we have the closed loop system with the closed loop transfer function H tilde. Uh, now, these um, these equations are similar but different. They actually relate to each other in a very uh, important result, uh, which is shown here. So basically, H tilde, which is the closed loop transfer function, uh, is equal to the inverse of the identity matrix plus H, uh, everything times H. This is a very interesting, important result, and we'll, we'll go back to this. All right, so we have all that setup done. We can actually do a uh, frequency domain analysis. And, and the idea behind this is that we want to understand what the steady state behavior of the system is um, when you excite the system at a particular frequency, OK? And, and this is important because um, sometimes the system's response to certain frequencies is undesirable. And there's basically two uh, undesirable behaviors of, of of the system. Uh, the first one is perhaps the most obvious, where the system actually becomes unstable at certain frequencies, uh, where if you apply that uh, uh, frequency as an input, the system actually just blows up, the response just blows up. Uh, and the second possible response is um, the system actually tracks certain frequencies too well. Uh, and if the frequencies are small, this usually isn't a problem. But when frequencies are really high and the system still tracks those pretty pretty well, that can be a problem because the panels might be wiggling at a really high frequency, and that's that's definitely not desirable. Um, so to understand this, we um, analyze the open loop transfer function. And one thing that's really important to understand is that even though we're analyzing the open loop transfer function, uh, we're still describing the closed loop behavior. Uh, so for a given k, we're trying to understand if the closed loop behavior is um, 
is good or not. And so to do that, we, we sort of look at these two margins, the gain margin, the phase margin. Um, and these really come from the relationship between the closed loop system and the open loop system, which, I, which I'm showing on the bottom right. Um, when H is really close to minus one, that, that term that's inverted um, goes to zero. And so the whole, uh, the, so the closed loop transfer function actually blows up. That's obviously undesirable behavior. Uh, so what these margins tell us is whether or not we're close to that instability. So whether or not we're close to that minus one response. And here minus one is represented by um, a magnitude of one with a phase of minus 180 degrees. Um, so the gain margin, what it tells us is if the system's response is at minus 180 degrees, how close are we to that gain of equal to one or equal to zero degree? That's our gain margin. How much can we gain at the system until it becomes unstable? Um, since similar thing for the phase margin, the phase margin is when the system's gain, the output is one or zero dBs, uh, what's our margin in terms of phase to that minus 180 degrees? Okay, and obviously the bigger the margins, the better. It means our system is more robust and it's farther away from that instability region. All right, so I'm here I'm just going to show a quick numerical example. So um, here the problem setup, again, is very, very similar to what I showed before. Uh, just a few further considerations here. So the panels are going to move uh, symmetrically. So we're going to analyze how the rotation, the rigid body rotation of those panels uh, actually influence the response. Um, and the body axis here, we have X along that rigid rotation of the panels. We have Z pointing up towards the hub and then Y is towards us. Um, and then each panel will have three modes. We'll have a bending mode, a torsional mode, and a pinwheel mode, uh, each at different frequencies. And I'll, I'll um, talk about the impact of those frequencies and, and the results that we see. So first of all, the open loop analysis for the x-axis. So here's the problem that we're, what we're doing is we're inputting, our, our, our input is along the x-axis, and we're trying to understand what the output is along that x-axis as well. And so this is the body plot response. Uh, so on the top, we have the um, magnitude of the response in terms of the frequencies. And um, we on the bottom, we have the argument of the response in terms of the frequencies. Um, so what we see here is actually, uh, for the most part, pretty standard. Um, this is a very standard uh, response, system response. Uh, you'll see some artifacting and some mirror on the right side. That's to be expected. Um, that happens at near the control, uh, the, the, the control sample time. So um, in, in our case, our, our control frequency is 10 Hertz. Uh, and so the Nyquist frequency corresponding is five Hertz. So uh, the results really are only viable up to five Hertz. And then after that, that's where we see that, um, that aliasing and that those artifacts. Uh, but you'll see that there's um, quite a pronounced uh, change in behavior around one Hertz. And so if we zoom into that, uh, what we'll see is that this is actually the behavior of one of the modes, okay? And if you look closely, you'll see that the mode, um, the, this mode behavior actually occurs at around 0 0.85 Hertz, which is, which corresponds to the torsional mode. And that makes sense, right? So the, because the x-axis is along that rigid rotation, um, when we're looking at the x-axis, and we're excited about that axis, uh, we're just twisting uh, the panel. That's the mode that we're exciting, right? Uh, and so, yeah, that makes sense. It excites at, at 0.85 hertz. And another interesting thing is that um, all lines here are overlapping. Um, and so it doesn't really matter at which angle the axis, the panels are, uh, the response will be the same. And again, that makes sense because we're looking at the, um, we're looking through the axis of rotation. And so changing it will excite the mode in the exact same way. If we go over to the Y axis, uh, again, the response is, is sort of for the most part similar to the X axis, but the mode is going to be different. So if we zoom in again, um, what we'll see is that actually changing the um, rotation, so the, the angle of that solar panel will influence the uh, system's response. Um, and so at zero degrees, what we see is that the response is roughly 0 0.72 Hertz, which corresponds to the pinwheel mode. 
Um, and that makes sense because at zero degrees, the panels are facing Y. And so when we excite the system about Y, we're going to be twisting the panels in a pinwheel mode. Um, so that makes sense. And then as we go from zero to 90 degrees, what's going to happen is at 90 degrees, the panel is actually going to be facing Z. So it's going to be completely perpendicular to Y. And so when we excite the system about Y, the panels are actually going to twist. They're actually going to bend. Sorry, not twist, bend. Um, and so in that case, at 90 degrees, we're actually exciting the bending mode. And, and as you'll see that from zero to 90, it actually shifts to the right because uh, the pinwheel is at 0.72 hertz and then bending is at 0.97. Finally, for the z-axis, the response is actually quite similar. And if we zoom in, the only difference is that at zero degrees, we're not exciting the pinwheel mode. We're actually ex exciting the bending mode because the panel is at zero degrees completely perpendicular to Z. And then at, uh, at zero degrees, and then at 90 degrees, the panel is facing Z. And so we're actually exciting the, um, we're exciting the pinwheel mode instead. All right, and that's my presentation.